Hi, I'm Andrew Donahue, Museum Curator and Director of Cultural Affairs for the Indian Museum of North America here at Crazy Horse Memorial. I'm coming to you today from the Mountain View Room as a part of a program we call Collections Up Close. It's an opportunity for you, the visitor and supporter, to see some of the things from within our collection that you don't ordinarily get to see and to understand a little bit more of the work that we do. Now, unfortunately, we can't have you to be up close here with us right now. And in the interest for public safety and the good of our community, Crazy Horse Memorial is temporarily closed to the public until further notice. Please follow us on crazyhorsememorial.org for more information about this closure and follow us on Facebook at Crazy Horse Memorial and the Indian Museum of North America at Crazy Horse Memorial for more information about this closure and as well to see other programs that we're offering online. In the next several weeks, you'll see a lot of different videos and information of collections up close and other items that you'll see the next time you come to visit us. So without further ado, let's talk about some of the collections today from the Navajo rugs in a region in the Southwest we call the Four Corners. So the pieces that you're going to see today all come from the collections here at the museum. And they're all items, uh, well, mostly items, that relate to the Navajo people. The Navajo people lived in the Four Corners region between Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And that's still the traditional homes of the people uh, today. Now, they and the Apache are very closely related to the Athabascan language group that uh, is said to have migrated around the year 1000 from very far north up into Alaska. You still find that the language components have a relationship, a very close tie between those people. And they can still speak the same language that's identifiable to both cultures. Weaving is a practice that came about as a result of that movement. So some of the earliest examples of the pieces we're going to be looking at include the textiles uh, that, again, from the Navajo people, have depictions of everyday life, or what we call pictorials. One such as this, or an example like this, shows different depictions of uh, the life of perhaps a farmer or on the ranch there in the southwest. Now the earliest examples of some of these other textiles will include images that we know to be what's called the ye. The images that we see on rugs like this one are the ye. The ye are a physical embodiment of a spiritual being. Now, these spiritual beings embodied several different characters amongst Navajo culture. They were representatives that would sort of be the intermediary or the voice between humans on earth and uh, the spiritual beings and the spiritual realm. They would represent different things and different elements in the known world. And so celebrations or ceremonies that would take place involving the Ye were a means which to communicate to, uh, to the god or gods about different things on earth, such as corn, the land, different minerals, food, all these factors. Now, whereas with that earlier example, we saw some of the natural, uh, very natural colors, bright, vibrant colors started to make their way into Navajo culture in years later with trade and with uh, development and commerce. Here we still see uh, the original images of the Ye, and those spiritual beings, but with much more modern colors. In the early 1800s, Navajo weavings most, mostly consisted of natural browns, white, and some indigo dyes that were available through trade. Eventually, trade and commerce led to more colors becoming available, such as black, green, yellow, and a very popular red. Indigo blue was used to create colors that ranged between a pale blue and a near black. Indigo could be mixed with indigenous yellow dyes, such as rabbit brush plant, to obtain bright greens. Red is the most difficult dye to create locally, and it comes from an extract made from cactus beetles. Early Navajo textiles used cochineal beetle to make reds. Black dye came through pinion and pine sap, or pitch, mixed together with burnt ashes. Larger depictions such as this one came about because of other developments within the spirituality and culture. Images such as this that depict the Ye in a particular dance actually came about because of an earlier art form known as sand painting. Now, sand paintings were done by the Navajo as a healing ceremony. Granulated sand was laid out in these intricate and delicate patterns that would include images such as the Ye, 
but they were done in healing ceremony for the people, and they were meant to be destroyed within a matter of 12 hours. The person receiving that healing would sit in the hogan with the sand painting, receive that healing energy through song and, and through ceremony, and then the sand paintings were destroyed. Later, sand paintings were encouraged to be preserved using um, well, glues and other paints to kind of help keep them in place. And then eventually, that same imagery found its way into weaving practice and can be seen in large rugs such as this one. Navajo textiles were originally used for utilitarian purposes, such as cloaks, dresses, saddle blankets, and other similar purposes. Towards the end of the 19th century, weavers began to make rugs for tourism and export. The weave themselves and the yarns come from a heavy influence of Spanish uh, invasion. Now, it didn't mean that this was something that was forced upon. Rather, the Navajo tradition is to infuse and to survive. So, through using Spanish sheep and Spanish wool, they developed their own processes to create their own original style and trade. So here we have a miniature example of what a loom might have looked like. The suspended wood frame holds up the bars that hold everything together for the weave. The vertical lines are known as the warp, and the weft goes in between, in and out, and weaves in between the warp. This is how this whole process takes place. As far as the culture goes, weaving is traditionally a feminine art and done mostly by women, until recent years when there have been more male weavers into the artistic community. One of the reasons for this is the belief in the spirituality of the rugs. Traditionally, as taught by Navajo people, there is a being known as the spider woman who wove into existence all of human life. So, this has very deep ties into those spiritual uh, elements and ideas. And that's where all of this kind of comes together and where you see that culture and art interconnect. As time went on, different access to cultures and different ideas led to new materials and new ways for Navajo weavers to make a living, to access different colors through uh, commerce, commerce and trade, and as well to start to create their own style. One of the elements that you find common amongst many Navajo rugs is a concept of a spirit line. It would be one singular thread tied to the center color pane of a rug that would find its way into the outer weaving and out of the rug. The concept and idea implies that the spirit of the weaver could enter in and out of the rug and continue to perfect their art. In the early 20th century, in reservation times, Anglo traders who owning trading posts would encourage individual weavers to start to draw inspiration from Persian rug designs. This would make rugs more marketable and appealing to collectors in New England and throughout the Midwest. This era spawned an individual style that led to different ideas and styles of rugs, such as Tichnes Pose, Two Gray Hills, and Ganado Rugs. The next rug we're going to see is my particular favorite, Two Gray Hills. Two Gray Hills rugs are named after the region they come from, Two Gray Hills and Totalina, where the original trading posts were located. Now the rugs themselves are very rare. They're made mostly from natural color dyes. The original dyes would use white and brown woven and carded together very intricately to create the different dip, deep colors, such as brown and a cold steely gray. Black would also be made from indigo dyes as well and found its way into these designs. They're known for their symmetry, having four similar regions within the rug, and the exact symmetry in the center location as well. So rugs like this could fetch a very high price at these original trading posts. And the weave of the yarn itself is so tightly woven by these master weavers that they could even reflect water and become watertight. Navajo weaving is representative of the synthesis of several different cultural influences and styles, from Spanish wool to trade and design. It's also a means by which Navajo culture has continued to survive 
and thrive by a new commercial market. Navajo weavings are just some of the weavings that we have in the collections here at the Indian Museum of North America. Our collections and our mission preserve the culture, tradition, and living heritage of indigenous cultures on the North American continent. That includes other weavings of other cultures, including this Zapotec rug, which came from a region near Osaka, Mexico. To see more of these types of items and to hear more of the items and more of the stories from the collections of the Indian Museum of North America, follow us on Facebook. In the next several weeks, we'll be doing presentations on Pueblo pottery and on some of the collections of the story that teach our history here at Crazy Horse Memorial. I'm Andrew Donahue, Museum Curator and Director of Cultural Affairs here at the Indian Museum of North America, and I want to thank you for joining us. Come back again to see our collections up close.